Vice-Chancellor, fellow council members, staff of the university, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. The graduation ceremony is an important and happy occasion for members of the university community. To all of you, I extend a very warm welcome, especially to those of you who have not been to the university before. To the graduates, I offer my warmest congratulations. The completion of a university degree is indeed a fine achievement and one of which you should be proud. For you today is a day of celebration. To families and friends of the graduates, while the university cannot offer you a, an award as well, we do recognize the enormous contribution you've made in supporting your loved ones through the highs and lows of their time as a student. You're about to witness something very special, the reward for all that effort. The success of the university is measured by the quality of its graduates. Survey results show us that employers are very happy with the quality of our graduates, and our graduates have a high level of satisfaction with their education experience at the university. The University of Newcastle is committed to preparing graduates who will make significant contributions to society, are adaptable global citizens, and are sought after by employers. To achieve this goal, the university is innovative in its approach to teaching and learning, notably through problem-based learning in which the university is a pioneer and more recently through developments in online learning. In the area of research performance, this university is ranked amongst the top 10 Australian universities with an annual research expenditure of $36 million. This is an exceptional achievement. Whether you are here today to receive your first undergraduate degree or a higher degree, you will have acquired knowledge and developed the ability to think logically and laterally. Qualities that are highly valued by employers worldwide and will stand you in good stead in the process of lifelong learning. You are one of 3,642 students who will graduate from the University of Newcastle this semester. Selected data from the profile of graduating students show some interesting characteristics. 80% of you will be awarded an undergraduate degree. 18% will receive a coursework master's degree and 2% will be awarded a research master's or a doctor of philosophy degree. It took you approximately 5,000 hours of study to complete the requirements for your degree. 80% of you will have a hex debt. <laughs> your average hex debt is $20,000. Collectively, you owe the Australian government over 50 million. <laughs> this year's graduates, ages range from 20 to 71 years, and 58% of you are women. Three quarters of you who are looking for full-time work when you completed your degree will have found it. Your average salary is $35,000 per year, and 2% of you went on to further full-time study. And where do you live? 63% of you live in the Hunter and Central Coast region. 4% live overseas. Yours is the last generation of Australians who will be the first in the family to gain a university education. The rate of change in our society is such that whatever qualification you've completed, you will need to be engaged in lifelong learning to remain successful and competitive in the workforce. 
I'm confident that the skills you've acquired during your study at this university will stimulate your hunger for more knowledge and understanding. This in turn will equip you to make valuable contributions to the local, national and international community. I take this opportunity to remind those receiving their test aimers today that as graduates of the university you automatically become members of the graduate body, the convocation. You join more than 70,000 other graduates worldwide and have an opportunity through elected representatives to become involved in the governance and the development of your university. I now call on Associate Professor Glenda Strawn, Deputy Executive Dean of the Faculty of Business and Law to, rep to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Business, Barbara Akimpong. <laughs> Christy Adam. <laughs> Christy Adams. Maida Alonso. Robert Angus. Neil Armstrong. Jason Arthur. Joanne Bailey. <laughs> Jessica Baker. <laughs> Kim Bates. <laughs> Renee Beager. Amy Bertoli. Grant Bevan. Ryan Birchnell. Donna Blackman. Catherine Bonzol. <laughs> Catherine Burke. <laughs> Michael Burke. <laughs> Bradley Bauer. Christy Brennan. <laughs> Sonia Brockman. <laughs> Ian Brown. <laughs> Liam Burns. Dean Burrows. <laughs> Danielle Cameron. <laughs> Lucas Carr. <laughs> Colin Catto. Catherine Colligan. <laughs> Nathan Colthorpe. <laughs> ben Cook. <laughs> J. 
Jade Kostick. <laughs> Emma Cother. <laughs> James Craig. <laughs> Christy Cramp. Ryan Cramp. <laughs> Belinda Kubert. <laughs> Brooke Cummings. <laughs> Danielle Katrupi. Matthew David. <laughs> Samantha Davidson. <laughs> Leanne Davies. <laughs> Jacob Denny. Lisa Elkington. <laughs> Gregory England. <laughs> Nathan Eshman. <laughs> Vanessa Evans. Jacqueline Fox. <laughs> Ainsley Frost. <laughs> David Gabriel. <laughs> Francis Gardner. Nadia Georgoulis. <laughs> Lisa Ganain. <laughs> Patrick Hancock. <laughs> Kate Hardy. Belinda Harvey. Joel Hawkins. Brendan Hay. Gary Hazel. Carly Hearn. <laughs> Gregory Hill. <laughs> Lauren Hogman. <laughs> Linda Hoskinson. Lisa Howard. Brooke Jones. John Paul Kelly. May Yi Kong. Roslyn Larkin.
David Lee. Erin Layton. <laughs> Natasha Marsh. <laughs> Andrew Mayne. <laughs> Peter MacArthur. Matthew Mercer. <laughs> Lily Machevsky. <laughs> Nicole Montoya. <laughs> Lauren Morgan. Christine Mully. Jasmine Neo. Jennifer Noonan. Mudiwa Niabadsa. Emily Pamovsky. <laughs> Andrew Paskin. <laughs> Teresa Padegian. <laughs> Trent Pickles. Marilyn Prattley. <laughs> Elizabeth Proskofietz. <laughs> Catherine Proskofietz. <laughs> Amy Ray. Peniel Root. <laughs> Belinda Sandal. <laughs> Yoland Schunderbeek. <laughs> Terence Shadwell. Amy Simmons. <laughs> Tamara Smedley. <laughs> Joanna Smith. <laughs> Anna Sunantha. Shane Spruce. <laughs> Kelly Staniland. <laughs> Regina Steep. <laughs> Travis Stevenson. Sean Stevens. <laughs> Joshua Swetnam. <laughs> Julie Tanswell. <laughs> David Thomas. Benjamin Tinman.
Kerry Undery. <laughs> Kelly Vain Tempest. <laughs> Ulsa Vodansky. <laughs> Joel Wales. Stacey Warren. Gregory Webb. Courtney Weston. Gillian Wibley. Benjamin Wynn. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Business and Bachelor of Commerce. The graduates have studied for both awards simultaneously. Karina Foran. <laughs> Kathleen Lonergan. Joanne Wharton. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Business Honours, Class 2, Division 1, Nathan Baker. <laughs> Sarah Bolton Hall. Alison Hart. <laughs> Amy Hendry. <laughs> Darylin Law. <laughs> Timothy Lee. Faith Turner. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Business Honours, Class 1, Fabio Boresti. <laughs> Christopher Stanton. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Economics, Andrew Arthur. <laughs> James Butler. <laughs> Nigel Gates. Alicia Houston. <laughs> David Howard. <laughs> ben Arland. <laughs> Adam McDougall. Glenn McFarlane. <laughs> Scott Moore. <laughs> Dylan Murray. <coughs> Emily Novak Nimella. Todd Pierce. <laughs> Anthony Purcell. <laughs> Chris
Kristen West. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Economics and Bachelor of Business. The graduates have studied for both awards simultaneously. Jared Stevenson. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degrees of Bachelor of Economics and Bachelor of Commerce. The graduates have studied for both awards simultaneously. Angela Bohm. Robin Gill. Sarah Gurr. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Economics Honours, Class 2, Division 1, William Brown. Matthew Bullock. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Finance, Cheryl Bryden. <laughs> Nigel Hale. Mark Jones. <laughs> Heather Mackey. <laughs> Talani McInnes. <laughs> Gavin Murray. Christy Purden. Mark Redding. Lincoln Spence. Samantha Toll. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws, Natalie Barr. Robin Bell. Alison Butler. David Katalovsky. <laughs> Shane Chisholm. <laughs> Louise Clark. <laughs> Anna Coates. Donna Dennis. <laughs> Peter Dockrell. <laughs> Patrice Farmer. <laughs> Brian Goldsmith. Philippa Hall. <laughs> Danielle Hocking. <laughs> Mao Shui Jiang. <laughs> Nathan Kelly. Dane Lind. <laughs> J. 
Jennifer Loveday. April Lucas. Alison McKenzie. Sharon Mackay. Melanie O'Brien. Adrian Relf. Ben Sharp. Rebecca Vaughan. John Wilton. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with Honours Class 2, Division 2, Megan Hurd. <laughs> Stephen Law. Michelle Oberdorf. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with honours Class Two, Division One, Joel Sturgeon. <laughs> Tony Sunol. Gillian Vine. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with Honours Class 1, Mary Bowen. Elizabeth McLaughlin. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with the award of Diploma of Legal Practice, Nita Alexander. <laughs> Owen Ayers. Scott Bishop. <laughs> Matthew Bleeker. <laughs> Michael Burke. <laughs> Amy Hyde. Maria Jackson. Amy King. Daniel Lewis. Chantel Peterson. Daniel Phelan. Christopher Ryan. Luke Sessions. Rachel Sharon. Peter Sladen. <laughs> Ryan Walker. <laughs> Mark Zaki.
Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with the award of Diploma of Legal Practice with Honours Class II, Division II. Catherine Daffo. <laughs> Dominic Mason. <laughs> Melissa Simpson. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with the award of Diploma of Legal Practice with Honours Class II, Division I. Renee Boundy. <laughs> Paula Loosely. <laughs> Matthew Bryan. Mark Evans. <laughs> Angela Harvey. <laughs> Natasha Nalda. <laughs> Kim Probert. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with the award of Diploma of Legal Practice with Honours Class I. Christy Brown. <laughs> Luke Grabda. <laughs> Wan Ching Tio. Rachel Watts. <laughs> Rebecca Wood. <laughs> Chancellor, the award of a university medal is a rare honour, made only when there is a candidate of sufficient merit. To be considered for this award, a graduate must have a consistent record of exceptional academic achievement at all levels of a bachelor's degree and qualify for a bachelor's degree with first class honours. The Evert Medal is named in honour of the Honourable Justice Elizabeth Evert, companion of the Order of Australia and a former Chancellor of the University. The Evert Medal is awarded annually to the graduating student with the best performance in either the Bachelor of Laws or in the combined Bachelor of Laws Diploma of Legal Practice. I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Laws with the award of Diploma of Legal Practice with Honours Class I and both the University Medal and the Everett Medal. Corey McCatton. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Trade and Development, Kelly Pickshan Kwok. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Business and Law. We will now have a musical interlude presented by Gavin Clark on cello performing Prelude from Suite Number 1 by Bach. Thank you. 
Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite Ms Samantha Martin to deliver the occasional address. Samantha Martin is the General Manager of Newcastle University Sport, also known as New Sport, the organisation responsible for managing sport, leisure and recreation for the university. She has been instrumental in driving the recent merger of two sports organisations on campus and overseeing the integration of over 100 staff into the new arrangement. Samantha has a Bachelor of Business and a Master of Human Resource Management and Industrial Relations degree from the University of Newcastle and is currently studying a Master's in Commercial Law. Samantha has represented the university in the World Sports Aerobics Championship winning team in 2000 and 2001, is chair of the Cancer Council Relay for Life, a board member, member of the Hunter Business Chamber and has won the 2002 Telstra Young Businesswoman of the Year and the 2002 Hunter Business Chamber Young Business Achiever Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, Samantha Martin. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, members of council, university staff, university graduates, families and friends. When I was asked to present the occasional address today at graduation, I was absolutely thrilled, but very, very apprehensive. I knew it would be a diverse gathering of, um, of people in the Great Hall today, accomplished academics, Novocastrian identities, businessmen and women of the Hunter, a broad range of graduates from a number of different disciplines. So a diverse gathering indeed. So what I did was I prepared two speeches. What I need from you to help me select which presentation I go with is a little bit of participation, graduates only. Now graduates, your participation in this exercise is absolutely necessary for me to gauge which presentation is most appropriate and needless to say, please be honest. Please note though that this exercise is not really based on reliable data and given that someone once told me that 78% of statistics were incorrect, I figure maybe you can question the um, results of this exercise. But graduates, you need to participate. Number one, I'll give you three animals. Number two, you choose one of those three animals that you think best represents your characteristics or you can identify with. Don't, don't tell anyone, don't tell the person beside you. And raise your hand at the end of the exercise when I asked which animal you selected so that we can get some feedback and I can select this or this presentation. You ready? The animals graduates are cow, tiger and sheep. Now think about it, three to select from, just choose one. All right, show of hands, those that selected cow. <laughs> uh. Your priorities in life, the research indicates, is career, career and more career. Cows prove how useful a little cunning wisdom can be in dealing with difficult people and difficult situations. Tigers? Here we go. Your priorities in life are family and friends and you yearn to feel wanted in your personal and professional relationships. Tigers are loved and respected for their natural leadership ability and regal nature. Leaves us with sheep. Oh, sheep. Is there any? Okay. Sheep, your priorities in life are intimacy, love and lust. And the rest I really don't think is appropriate for today. So I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, graduates, for your participation in the exercise. I've now ascertained that neither presentation is going to suit the group today. So what I'm going to share with you is some of my own personal experiences as a student here at the University of Newcastle and how those experiences have had a great impact on business strategies that I've adopted throughout my career thus far since graduating. University experience number one. I left Maitland Girls High School and started a degree here at the university, a Bachelor of Business. My first moment of truth was during a subject called Action Learning. I received an assessment task back and it had 5 out of 20 on the bottom of the assessment task. It had analysis, very poor, and comments down the bottom, I quote, 
Young lady, this is not of academic standard. You need to decide whether you're at university or not. I took that assessment task home to my parents and they said, young lady, you should decide whether you want to be at university or not. <laughs> and fortunately, I graduated in 1994 with a Bachelor of Business. Business strategy number one then is you can analyse the past, but you will design the future. University experience number two. When I graduated from university, I went to work in a small local organisation and very quickly learnt that the issues that I was dealing with, whether they were operational or strategic, that I was facing each day, they didn't teach me in the textbooks. I had learnt fantastic frameworks and models and case studies, but it wasn't always the organisational reality. Despite some really positive aspects of this work environment, I was constantly referred to as darling, sweetheart, honey. In addition, simple words such as please and thank you never really were used when giving a request or making an order. Some of the graduates may have also experienced this in their um, employment life to date thus far. That do it or else attitude, young lady, you're lucky to have a job. Business strategy number two then, focus on always being polite and using simple words such as please and thank you when you're making a request or you're giving an order. In addition, do not call people names like sweetheart or darling or honey unless you know them very well. That person probably thinks it's quite condescending or arrogant. University experience number three. I vividly recall group work presentations. One that stands out in my mind was during a second year industrial relations subject. The presentation was to be 20 minutes maximum. There were six in my group and therefore we had about three and a half minutes each to present. Now, by the time we had moved to our second speaker, the other students in the, in the class were scribbling on paper. One student up the back of the class I'm sure had dozed off. The tutor had left the room and I was the sixth speaker. After the most significantly boring 50 minutes in academic history, our presentation was concluded not by the tutor, but the fact that there was a tutorial group in the room after us. Business strategy number three then, be bright, be brief and be off. <laughs> what other experiences and learning can I attribute to university? I tripled my vocabulary. I'd learnt new words at O Week celebrations and beach parties, words that I'd never heard of. And I learnt how to swear and that doing so in front of my parents in the front row today, the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor, is highly inappropriate. I learned how to ask questions, how to think for myself, how to meet deadlines and accept the consequences if I didn't, and how not necessarily to accept everything that I was told. Specifically in marketing, and the business students I imagine would identify with me here, I learnt that a SWOT analysis had absolutely nothing to do with catching flies, that sacred cows often made the best beef burgers, and that the four P's are not Porsche, pub crawl, pleasure and playboy. The University of Newcastle gave me the opportunity to exchange ideas to value scholarship and a real sense of community. I encourage all of the graduates here today to maintain your strong association with the University of Newcastle. Grow and maintain your existing networks and actively participate in University of Newcastle alumni functions and convocation events. This, in my opinion, is the most beautiful campus in Australia, with the most superior sporting and recreational facilities and services for the students, staff and general community to enjoy, something we should all be really very proud of. Today is a milestone in your lifelong learning process without a doubt. Life is large, however. Do not pigeonhole yourself by the degree that you have necessarily studied. Build on your experiences here, as I have, and go on to achieve the reward of a healthy, satisfying and varied life. Carry with you always the snapshots of happy memories of the good times that you have had here at this outstanding university, the University of Newcastle. Graduates, I sincerely congratulate you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ms. Martin. That's pretty sound advice. I now have great pleasure in inviting Rene Boundy, Bachelor of Laws and Diploma in Legal Practice, to speak on behalf of the graduates. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, members of the Council, staff of the University, family and friends of graduates, and most importantly, graduates. Nelson Mandela once stated, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this speech will invite each of you to think about that statement and to reflect upon the importance of education in giving us the freedoms to realise our own personal goals, as well as the aspirations of our community. For my part, I agree with Nelson Mandela that education is a powerful instrument of change. Education provokes thought and stimulates discussion. It equips people with the means to understand, analyse and critically evaluate aspects of our physical and social realities. It encourages the sharing of knowledge and ideas and challenges people to think about the way that they participate in the world around them. It empowers people to change their lives and the lives of others. And conversely, when opportunities to participate in education are limited, so too are knowledge, understanding, innovation and power to change. Graduates, take a moment to think about the how the opportunity to gain a tertiary education has impacted on your life. It may have already enabled you to gain employment in a particular field or profession. It may have equipped you with the means of entering paid employment for the very first time or improving your working, working conditions or your income. And for others, like many of the graduating LLB students, education has helped you to empower others by helping them to protect their rights and participate in our legal system. And others still have used your education to enter the public service to serve our community through involvement in the governance of our citizens. I hope that you can all recognise education itself as an opportunity and be grateful for it and for those benefits that will continue to flow from your participation in it. And as many of you move into positions of power and influence, I hope that you will continue to value the freedom that opportunities create and strive to create ways by which others can share the same freedoms and opportunities. For I believe that too often many of us take for granted the opportunities that are given to us. For a nation that believes in the truth of the ideal of equality, we often take it to be a given that opportunities are all equal. But as much as we take pride in the ideal of equality of all of our citizens, we must stop and recognise that equality is imperfectly realised. It is an aspiration and not a statement of fact. We are not all afforded equal opportunities in our society and we do not all have the same capacities to participate in our community. For graduating LLB students, you will clearly recognise this in the unequal capacity of our citizens to access our system of justice. For commerce or business or economic students, you may recognise this in the reality of economic disadvantage, unemployment, the unequal status of different groups in terms of rates of pay, unemployment rates, working conditions, or even the ability to work through the glass ceiling into the highest ranks in the public or private sectors. And unfortunately, many of you will have experienced some form of inequality firsthand. But it is despite this that we are all here today. We have all had the opportunity to continue our education and as I reflect on this, I see how education is in fact removing inequalities and creating change. For it is empowering people like me and like you to change your lives and to change our community. And further, education is acting as a symbol of our community's willingness to promote equality of opportunity and to remove barriers to equal opportunity to participate in our society. As I stand here today, I am able to see how truly diverse a group of individuals the graduating class is. I am proud to be an individual part of such a wonderfully distinct group, made up of men and women of different ages, racial and ethnic origins, sexual orientations, physical capacities, spiritual conscience, 
and socio-cultural practice. I am proud because I take the fact of our diversity to be a statement by our community that tolerance, diversity and equality are important social goals and are in fact achievable. For if our community makes it possible for such a group of distinct individuals to participate in further education and change our lives, then our community is making it possible for meaningful change to occur. And more importantly, we are practising the principles of equality, tolerance and diversity that our community aspires to. So ladies and gentlemen, I began by asking each of you to reflect on the power of education to give people the freedoms to change their lives and their community. And I conclude now by asking you all to join with me in congratulating the graduates, to celebrate our individual differences and our individual achievements, and to celebrate the fact of our diversity as a statement of our community's commitment to realising equality as a fundamental fact for all Australians. Congratulations. And thank you. I'd like to thank Renee Boundy for her speech and now declare the ceremony concluded. I hope you enjoyed today's ceremony and thank you for joining the university community in the celebration of the conferring of degrees. The University Union invites you to make your way to the Brennan Room and the Shortland Union, where no doubt your celebrations can continue.
have a living wage and be brilliant at the same time. Um, but today you can count yourselves as part of an elite. Now that isn't a remote and inhospitable tribe as some of our politicians seem to think. It simply means that you've been given access to ways of coping with the world. I don't think so much of the competencies that I, I know that you have gained here um, that might or might not fit you for a specific task in industry, but of the confidence I hope you've gained to think about the world around you and to find ways in which you might help to make it a better place. In humanities, arts, social sciences, and education, um, the principle of a liberal education, I think, still survives, just. Um, in the face of increasing political and economic pressure to make everything instrumental. This isn't just a problem for the arts. It applies to all branches of research, I think. The physical scientist, as much as anybody else, needs to be intellectually independent and to have room to experiment with ideas that might seem eccentric to the hardline pragmatist. I gather the CSIRO used to have about 10% um, of its budget set aside for the wild ones. It's gone. Um, but how often have you heard of a major breakthrough in science where the researcher says something like, well, we were working on the function of A when it came into contact with B, producing an unexpected result C, and one of the team made a wild speculation that if we took A, B, and put it next to the context C, we might just have produced an effect that could pro prove to be a miraculous cure R, or something of that kind. The researcher um, was fortunately not concentrating on the job at the hand in that case, if they'd been focused precisely on A, they would never have thought of the context C. And I think the Chancellor earlier on talked about, of course, the knowledge and the skills that you've been equipped with, but also he mentioned lateral thinking, and I think that is absolutely crucial here. You have to have sufficient breadth of knowledge to be able to make that lateral step, but the open-ended curiosity is what I hope you've all acquired through the contact you've had with ded dedicated academic staff and almost as importantly, your peers. For the artists, I'm delighted that you've been introduced into many different ways of working. And I think this applies to the designers as well. You've had the opportunity to see different ways of applying your skills to a whole range of public contexts, including industrial applications of imaging and design, planning and environmental design. But just be careful a little bit. There's a marvelous thing going on in creative industries but sometimes there's a little tendency in there that worries me. It's not only um, the artist, but all humanities as a whole, and it's to do with this notion of instrumentality. Uh, there's a variation of this tendency towards instrumentality that I've already noted um, in academic life. At first glance, it sounds great. It embraces the kind of multidisciplinary approach and the application of skills to industry that I've just extolled. The problem comes when the exponents of this tendency vehemently disparage the idea of the individual creative moment and ridicule it as an expensive and antisocial game for a small elite. In a recent paper, of all places, in the HRC journal in Canberra, a senior advocate of these ideas wrote that the concept of an individual act of greatness was automatically anti-democratic and diminished the rest of us by implication. I find that an incredibly sad idea. Um, the writer never came away from a concert, an exhibition, or a lecture totally exhilarated by the brilliance of the performance. I think most of us would feel that this world was very small and mean, um, if that was the case. And I think we are able to feel greatly enhanced and optimistic about being part of society that produces such moments. There are two points here, really. Firstly, that we can all aspire to having flashes of brilliance. And to, get, uh, to denigrate that aspiration is not doing any of us a service. And secondly, it makes a fundamental error about the social dynamic. The social scientists here will understand that the tension between the individual and the group is a fundamental engine that drives creativity and productivity in society. There's absolutely no need to choose between individual desires, aspirations, and achievements and the good of the group. Successful societies make full use of this dynamic tension and in fact, individuals may even extract a certain resource from the dynamic rhythms of give and take, binding and loosening, association and separation. And in fact, Leo Bassani, in a paper I was reading this week, has gone on to suggest that this kind of rhythm actually has connotations of erotic pleasure, which might help us to feel good about being in society and yielding to the group. 
For, there are, for the artists, um, there are great opportunities opening up for public artwork and collaborations with architects and planners, work in computer graphics, gaming and entertainment. However, there is always a need to find your own source of creative energy. Any amount of collaboration or community engagement is stimulating. But unless you're overpowered by your, so empowered by your own research, you're likely to run out of steam. I don't think this only applies to artists. I think it applies to all intellectual activity. You need your own passionate course, and you need to stick with it. One other problem uh, with the instrumental tendency is that it demands that academics project forward five years to a market niche and design their courses to equip the students to fill it. Seems to be an incredibly daft idea for two, re well, for obvious reasons. One thing that we know for sure is that we have no idea what it's going to be like in five years' time. And secondly, it seems to obviate the need for creative in creative industries. Let's just call it industry. Creativity necessarily involves individuals engaging with the social and political context. This is part of the resistance. It's the, like the uh, elastic on a catapult. But before the pellet will fly, you have to let go. A leap into the dark or an act of faith is something only individuals can make. It doesn't really suit the corporate context. Your education has equipped you to think independently and to take intellectual chances. Or I hope so. And when you go out to teach, don't let your students be bulldozed into a conveyor belt on the track to inevitable redundancy. I think you will encounter what I'm talking about, if you haven't already. Um, it's very much on, on government agenda, and it's finding its way into some universities. And I I'm, I'm know enough about this university to know that there's a um, very strong intellectual tradition and liberal tradition here, which I, I'm, I'm radically supporting. <laughs> We know that just like the lucky scientist, all creativity involves an element of chance. I actually told one of your postgraduate students recently that we all get lucky, but the trick is to notice when it happens. Indulge your curiosity. Everything you learned is probably already redundant because the system is dynamic. So keep up to date, keep excited about change. Learn to enjoy ducking and weaving, be part of it, and take chances. Good luck. mission from this evening's ceremony relates to Vicky Ann Sienzik, Bachelor of Fine Art with Honours Class 1, who is also recipient of the University Medal. I'd like to ask Ms Sienzik to come to the stage to receive the medal. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much for your address, Mr. Bond. I now have great pleasure in inviting I Ivan Powell to speak on behalf of the graduates. families and friends of graduates, and most importantly, graduates. Today's ceremony celebrates our transition, a liminal point in our lives, a rare threshold moment where we are able to savour our past and future in equal measures. Today, years of effort, application, and sometimes starvation <laughs> cease to be a lifestyle and become a foundation of our lives, an anchor to the future, whatever that may bring. It's an honour speak on behalf of my fellow graduates, uh, and it's also a challenge, a challenge to express adequately our collective sense of achievement, our myriad aspirations, and of course, our tremendous relief. Nor is it easy to touch meaningful, uh, meaningfully upon the experience and changes we have undergone in our time at the university. All the families, partners, friendships, staff, and lecturers who have supported us, shepherded us, and when required, badgered us toward our goal. 
Common to us all, however, is the environment we've inhabited these past years. The university has been as fertile a ground for academic and social life as it is for the famous Hexham Grey, the university's special breed of monstrous mosquitoes. <laughs> In this time, many of us have become Novo Novocastrians. We've moved up here, we've discovered Newcastle's easy charm, its abundance of watering holes, and its curious red and blue religion. When first I decided to move here, my mother assured me that Newcastle was Australia's best kept secret. And for me, that has proved to be so. Year by year, as I've lived in Newcastle, the character of the city has increasingly reflected the qualities and values of this very institution. And as undergraduates, we've been instrumental in that exchange. Accordingly, I think that we should recognise our time here as a foundation upon which we will continue to build upon ourselves and our society. Of our futures, in my experience, and I'm sure for many of us, the question most commonly asked of you when you identify yourself as a student of the arts or the humanities, people would like to know, what will you do with your degree when you finish? Or perhaps they ask, what job will your degree get you? I think that this question is a question born of anxieties that naturally attend a view of education through a narrow lens, a narrow lens of economic rationalism or perhaps occupational utility. It's an awkward question that neither owns nor allows a value to be placed on the critical, interpretive and creative disciplines of the humanities. Therefore, to that question, I would answer that whether we enter business or government, undertake further education, travel, write, have families, or even just merely have a lie down, the question should not be what, but how. How will you do with your degree? How will your learning inform your intellectual and emotional responses to work, family, relationships and the world in general. As arts graduates, we might then reply that we are imbued with a sense of the themes universal to, uh, to all humanity and equipped to explore, discover and express those themes for individual and collective betterments. I have no doubt that we've all been changed by our learning and our world is both more enriching and more enriched because of it. I've said that today we celebrate transition and I feel that it's inauspicious to linger at the threshold or to tread carelessly on the lintel. And I trust that by my words, I've done neither. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan Powell, for those words. I now declare this ceremony concluded. The University Union invites you to make your way to the University Club and the Shortland Union Courtyard where Devonshire tea will be served. I would have thought Callaghan tea would have been more appropriate. <laughs> A Testama framing service will be available in the foyer of the club. You'll be able to order photographs and view a range of university memorabilia for sale in the Shortland Union building. Graduates and guests are also invited to take the opportunity to meet with the staff of the university under the marquee next to the Great Hall before wending their way down to the Union to sample its delights. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
want to proclaim. Jesus, no man can hinder me. Ride on, King Jesus, no man can hinder me. I was but young when I began. No man can hinder me. But now my race is almost done. No man can hinder me. No man can hinder me. Ride on, King Jesus. No man can hinder me. Ride on, King Jesus. No hinder me. King Jesus rides a milk white horse. No man can hinder me. The river Jordan he cannot hinder me no man cannot hinder me ride on jesus Thank you, Francine Bell. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Lewin to deliver the occasional address. <laughs> Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, members of the council, staff of the university, distinguished guests, parents, and most of all, fellow graduates. I'm deeply honored to be standing before you here today, and my only regret is that my parents didn't live long enough to join us on this memorable occasion. <laughs> they would have been kvelling. Kvelling is the Yiddish word 
to describe the almost indescribable joy that only parents can feel when they've projected all their dreams and aspirations onto their children and then actually seen them realised. But anyway, I'm here to tell you a bit more about my story because some of it might be of value to you in your careers. Some idiot once said that if you invent a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Well, even though the world did eventually beat a path to my door, it was only after I'd been on national television. And in general, the person who popularised that mantra has a lot to answer for. A much wiser man, Thomas Edison, said, invention is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. I'm much more inclined to his view. As you heard, the light glow of inspiration, which is at the heart of the Triton Work Centre, came in a nanosecond. And it wasn't rocket science, and actually it couldn't have happened to a less likely looking guy on the face of it. <laughs> I knew almost nothing about woodwork, apart from that writing desk I built as a student, and I was all of three weeks into my new hobby. But with hindsight, it was probably that very innocence that was the key to my ingenuity. Unguided by the tram tracks of conventional wisdom, I was able to come up with a simple lateral idea, a solution to the cutting problems that were bugging me, and as it turned it turns out, thousands, millions of other would-be handymen hobbyists. And that was how to use a power saw accurately, safely, and with fine control to build decent looking furniture with it. I had, in a few weeks, with a few bits of wood, aluminium extrusion, and chipboard, replicated the basic functions of my next door neighbor's radial arm saw and his table saw, the two machines I was going to use before he moved out. My homemade gadget was horrible to look at, very clunky to use, not very safe but it worked. That was the easy bit, the 1%. The perspiration began as the product potential of my saw bench dawned on me. Conventional wisdom at that time decreed that radial arm saws and table saws had to be heavy, cast iron, complex, bolted down to the floor, and uh, very costly in terms of both dollars and workshop space, so it clearly out of the reach of the average hobbyist. My idea was a radical departure. It was made of sheet metal, simple and pretty safe to use, relatively accurate, portable, storable, and most important, inexpensive enough to be able to be afforded by or justified by the average hobbyist. I thought it was a great idea, novel and innovative, but to my amazement, the argument that it was too innovative was used again and again as a negative during those 16 frustrating months of trying to license or sell my idea. People who should have known better, the top people at power tool companies, hardware chains, major tool retailers, distributors, they all said the same thing. Too different, too hard to sell, too hard to get it approved, too much development needed, too little margin, too small a market, just too hard. None of them could see the potential that by now was obsessing me. Fortunately, youthful passion doesn't listen to reason, so I kept going despite their negativity. <laughs> and that brings me to make the point that Francine made a moment ago. If my experience is any guide, follow your gut, follow your passion, despite what experts might tell you. Question and challenge the dominant paradigm. Adopt a view of healthy skepticism when someone tells you, oh, you can't do that, or it'll never work, if you have a hunch that it might. Delight in flying in the face of conventional wisdom, because that's the way to push the envelope of human knowledge and social development. And be aware that people do tend to resist change, um, and this is particularly true if they have comfortable jobs with large and secure organisations. I came across, and, so doubt no, and no doubt so will you, huge corporate risk aversion and dis decision making which is glacial in pace. Don't let it stop you. Provided you do reality checks from time to time to ensure that you're not flogging a dead horse, keep pushing your ideas forward. The more radical they are, the harder it'll be to get them adopted, but the more worthwhile they'll be in the end. 
persistence and tenacity are key ingredients in innovation development, there is no easy road. I almost walked away several times during those early years, first when I got stuck building that dining table, then after 16 months of trying to sell my patent, and then there are another couple of excruciating occasions when the back backyard manufacture had become a nightmare of the worst order. 20, 22 hour days, seven days a week, about 360 days a year, frantic activity and a house that resembled the local tip. Desperate design changes have to be made from batch to batch to correct design, detailed design problems and with every problem that I fixed, I inadvertently created new ones. And all of this against the background of customers who are constantly begging, badgering or threatening me for their stock deliveries. I'd gone from a, a cushy and charismatic job as a journalist where I earned $20,000 or more in 1976, that was a huge amount of money, and I did it in 30 hours, 30 easy hours a week. And suddenly I'd gone to 140 hours a week, um, frantic, of frantic work, and uh, barely breaking even because I didn't know how to do a costing on my product properly. So the only thing that kept me going during that nightmare, during those first five years, was the seemingly endless demand created by the Inventors TV show, which some of you won't remember, but some might. Uh, without that TV show, the Triton workbench would almost certainly have been one of the early business failures, no matter how hard I worked, no matter how smart I was. I hung in on a learning curve that was nearly vertical, and I made almost every single commercial and technical mistake there is to make, generally, hopefully, only once each. <laughs> I trod on every single mine in the landmine of innovation development for a startup, but I was invulnerable because of that awesome demand unleashed by the TV show. It gave me the grace of time to get my act together as a designer, manufacturer, and marketer of woodworking machines that were as good in execution as they'd always been in concept. There are many lessons I learned the hard way in those early years that have since become business and marketing truisms. Among them, listen closely to your customers because sometimes they know more than you do. Well, in my case, they almost all knew more than I did. <laughs> I had to listen. Service your customers to pieces. You can't give too much service. My inexperience caused huge customer problems in the beginning. The least I could do was develop the right attitude and try to fix them. It became ingrained in the corporate culture. Dedicate yourselves to continuous improvement. It was at least five years before the product design of the Triton workbench finally started to settle down. But by then, it had become a habit to constantly improve our products, our marketing and our customer service. Finally, don't be, a, don't be afraid to make mistakes. <laughs> mistakes were all I knew back then, but somehow if you fixed them and learned, then it, they weren't so bad after all. They happened for a reason, to teach you something, and they were far preferable to wimping out and doing nothing. M several people have come up to me over the years and said to me, you know, I invented a saw bench just like you back in the 60s. The trouble was that they didn't do anything with it. They relied on the 1% inspiration and the world most certainly did not beat a path to their door. I could go on and on, but time's against us and I wanted to spend the balance of this address telling you about the Triton Foundation, which is something that I'm setting up with the help of a distinguished board of directors. It's not for profit and it's being funded by myself with contributions from the Victorian government, the Queensland government, and in-kind support from the federal government. It will do for up-and-coming inventors what the ABC TV show did for me back in 1976. It'll give them national exposure on a primetime TV show. Our working title is The Clever Country. But before putting them on TV, it will mentor them to ensure that, unlike myself, they are ready for the exposure. Inventors, especially the first-timers, will get what I so hoped for back then. Good, unbiased advice on patent protection, prototype building, testing, approvals, market research, business plans, 
licensing, capital raising, manufacturing. The foundation will provide free or subsidised advice and services to inventors and researchers from most fields and at most stages of development, from backyarders to small research teams to innovative SMEs. Not for the big guys who can pay for their own advertising and marketing, but for the smaller startups. Our organisation is currently being set up, a chief executive officer has been appointed, and a TV series has been designed. It's been offered to two leading networks with very favourable responses, and although no commitment has yet been made, negotiations are continuing. The Clever Country TV show will be an amalgam of the inventors beyond 2000 and quantum, a blend of high-tech, medium-tech and low-tech ideas. It'll create the exposure that's so desperately needed by startups, but will also take it one step further by making taking advantage of new technology. This will be convergent media at its best because viewers will be encouraged to ring a 1300 number or to log on to the Clever Country website and interact with either a computerised voice or a questionnaire and express their detailed opinions on what they've just seen. Using their phone keys or their mouse, viewers will answer a whole series of multiple choice questions including, for example, their preferred size, capacity, functionality, option level, materials, mode of operation, even the preferred colours. Viewers will also be able to enter, their, enter values giving their price expectation and will be able to gauge their reaction when they're told the likely selling price. A nationwide audience will be avidly watching this program under ideal conditions at home and they'll all see the identical presentation. And the viewers will be responding because they have a self-interest in acquiring one of these products or inventions shown. And so for all of those reasons, the feedback is going to be so much more accurate than that given to supermarket pollsters who corner you in the aisle with their clipboard. This instant, accurate national market feedback will be solid gold to our inventors in the 24 years that I ran Triton's R&D department, I know just how much time and effort is spent wheel spinning, trying to guess what the marketplace wants and at what price. We can take a lot of the guesswork out of it and help a lot of our inventors avoid costly mistakes. One final benefit is that viewers will be able to leave their phone number or their email address in one of, say, five separate lists. Potential consumers who want one they're your early adopters, your early cash flow. Investors who want to put money into it. Manufacturers who want a quote on it. Marketers who think they can sell it. Or indeed fellow researchers who can see an application of that technology in whatever they're working on, or vice versa. With all of these benefits, we hope to get many inventors to the starting line each year with nitroglycerin in their running shoes. We'll create a lot of heroes. Their ideas will get up much, much faster than currently, and they'll do much better on global markets, if indeed they have that potential, because their technology will still be fresh and new, but they'll have all of the experience and the cash flow from a successful domestic business. And then there's a bigger picture. Through mentoring our inventors and giving them TV exposure, we will inform, entertain, and inspire the general public and that will achieve our main goal, which is to promote a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in Australia, particularly among our youth. We can do it. We can be the clever country. We made a major national effort to revitalise our sporting sector after the disaster of the Montreal, Montreal